Hello, everyone, and welcome to Building Relationships with Children and Families from a Distance. We have a few housekeeping announcements before we begin. This session is going to be recorded and all participants will receive an email tomorrow afternoon with a certificate of attendance and a link, a link to, recording, to the recording. So keep that in mind as we go through this, this webinar today. My name is Shannon Lockhart and I'm an Early Childhood Applied Practice Manager for the High Scope Foundation. I have a master's degree in Early Childhood Education, which was jointly between Oakland University and the High Scope Foundation. I work directly with um, the Early Childhood Department and some with the, with the Research Department, uh, and I oversee the curriculum development and training for the infant and toddler curriculum, um, as well as help out with the preschool, and I oversee the training of trainers um, and the coaching process, pieces here at High Scope. I have served as um, a teacher in the demonstration classroom. Um, so like many of you, we wear lots of different hats here at High Scope. So I'm going to let Holly introduce herself and then we'll begin um, the webinar. Thanks, Shannon. Yes, my name is Holly Delgado and I am one of our early childhood specialists at High Scope Educational Research Foundation. Like Shannon, when I joined High Scope, I started with several years in our demonstration preschool um, and then have moved these past few years to working primarily with our assessment program, so with Core Advantage, but also doing some curriculum development and other um, types of coaching and support training um, work within High Scope. So we are so honored and glad that you all joined us today and we hope to be able to share some great information with you. So we have been doing a number of uh, webinars focusing on the preschool, um, but we want to let you know that we will we'll be switching a little bit and in doing some webinars, uh, focus on, on infant and toddler programs. Um, but again, we're gonna continue to support teachers throughout the year um, because we know this is going to be a very difficult year, not only for children, but also for us as teachers in the classroom. Um, so to help us do that, um, we're going to take a brief poll um, to be able to give us an idea of some times that would be helpful for you all. Um, now that we're all back in the classroom and, and teaching, you know, what would be the best times um, to uh, do these webinars um, for you so that we're supporting you in the classroom. So take a couple seconds or minutes to, or a couple of few minutes to, to do this, this poll for us. So we will take a couple more seconds. We thank you very much for uh, participating in this and we want to meet everyone's needs. So we'll do the best that we can to um, provide the times that will we'll generate as many people. Um, but just know that the recordings will be available too. So for today's webinar, we are going to focus on two aspects. There were a number of questions in previous webinars that were asked about interactions. You know, do children play independently? Do they play together? Um, how will we control interactions with children? Um, how do we comfort first time children or even children in distress? Can we hug them? Can, can we show them affection? How can we be responsive teachers without compromising children and teachers? These are really good questions. And so we wanna be able to um, focus on those questions and, and give some helpful tips and ideas to really help you in the classroom um, so that we can continue to build strong relationships with children in the classroom. Um, so for the first part of this webinar, we're gonna focus really on building those relationships in the classroom. So those authentic relationships um, and supporting children, even though we have these distant constraints. And then the second part, Holly's gonna lead us through um, looking at building relationships with children and families virtually. How do we establish those relationships first um, and when we've never really met them face to face? So how do we continue that communication and still be able to be accountable for those children that we're working with virtually? And then we will end with questions and answers. So first we're gonna discuss how to support children safely while building strong, a strong foundation for understanding relationships, even though um, there are these, these social distancing limitations. 
So we know this year is not going to be an ideal learning situation. Um, however, we do want to do the best that we can to provide ideal learning experiences because we know that even in those programs with four-year-olds or even with three-year-olds, but mainly, mainly with these four-year-olds, if we have four-year-olds in our classrooms, this is our only shot with them. You know, we, we hit one chance with them before they actually move on to formal schooling. So we want to give them the best experiences that we can within this COVID um, pandemic. So to set that stage for establishing these solid foundation for learning and building these social skills, we need to ensure that safety is happening. So we need to ensure that all these safety precautions have been put in place to allow these relationships to develop and to have healthy um, social emotional skills. So each program before they even open or even continue to provide care and education, they must have a preparedness and response plan in place. This ensures that all precautions are, are being met for COVID and that your program is going to follow these set guidelines if anything happens, especially if a teacher or a child gets sick, that these precautions are put in place and that they're followed. It's best to have a self-contained classroom with small group sizes and teachers and where teachers and children stay together. So programs have already put this in place. And then also we want to make sure that adults are wearing masks to protect children and protect um, the classroom as well. We also know that within these preparedness um, uh, plans, uh, classrooms are going to continue to be sanitized every day. Not only the classroom, but tables and chairs and materials will be disinfected every day and even throughout the day. You know, we have a big responsibility in, in making sure that materials are kept clean for children. Um, early childhood, the early childhood field is, is good at disinfecting. You know, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, we, we always have done this because we need to keep children safe. Um, so now we're just up, stepping up our game and, and adding more opportunities throughout the day to not only disinfect materials, but to continue to practice those hygiene um, uh, practices and washing hands and you know, cleaning noses and washing hands. So washing hands is going to be pretty big in our classrooms this year. We are also called to practice safe distance and CDC as well as licensing bodies say to the extent possible. Um, so in programs where we know we have small classrooms, we're not going to have the six feet that, that we do in, in bigger classrooms. So we're going to provide the best opportunities that we can to keep children safe within a, a safe distance to the extent that we can. If we have more children or small rooms, we may not have the choice to, to, to particularly have children close or even far from each other. Um, but again, we already have set most of the important safety guidelines in place to allow interactions that may be closer than six feet, like you see in this picture here. When this happens, we may need to wear masks, not only ourselves, but children might need to wear masks as well so that we're keeping um, that safety in place. Having pictures of teachers, uh, children, or having pictures of teachers and children in the classroom without their masks so children can get to know the teachers and get to know the children. Um, this is going to help with their social emotional development. Um, clear masks would be best if you can get clear masks because we know that children are not only learning um, social skills, but they also are learning um, language and pronunciation of language. And all of that takes place um, with not only our body language, but our facial expressions as well. So let's think about other professions before we jump and dive into our own professions to help us get a perspective of the early childhood field. Um, a good friend and colleague of mine um, gave a good illustration. Her name is Christine Snyder. And um, when you go to the doctor or the dentist, um, they have all these precautions put in place, just like we're putting in place in our programs. Um, this allows them to do their jobs the best to their abilities. So the same for other professions like dentists and restaurants and grocery stores, department stores. You don't see them standing six feet away trying to, to clean your teeth or, or help you when you're in pain. They're right there with you um, doing the best that they can to help serve you. Um, so, so that's what we need to do um, in, in our classrooms with our children. So even though there may be differences 
they are still keeping safety for their customers in mind. Um, even members of our families with, with COVID, um, you know, they don't stop loving us. Um, they don't stop showing us affection. They don't stop interacting with us because they have COVID, but they do put things into place to help with that safety. So we wanna keep that in mind as we go through this, this uh, webinar. We have even more important jobs to provide care and education to our children, and which doesn't mean that we forget being teachers and who we've been trained to be as responsive and supportive teachers for children. As we think about relationships and social skills, we have to keep in mind um, active learning, which is at the heart of the high scope curriculum. Children learn through active engagement with objects, ideas, events, and most importantly, with people in their, in their environment to help them learn and develop. Um, so active learning is vital to children being able to not only learn physically and cognitively, but also socially and emotionally. So before we dive, we can dive into the strategies for building relationships with children in the classroom, we need to see why relationships are so important to early childhood. Children grow and develop in a context of healthy and healthy relationships. Their sense of self and who they are within a family or classroom or community is formed through the interactions and relationships. Eric Erickson's stages of social emotional development are trust and mistrust, autonomy versus shame and doubt, and initiative um, and versus guilt. This age is a key time where children are learning about relationships. Trusted through trusted relationships with adults and they're learning friendships with others. Children are social beings from even from infancy. We are social beings. Um, what is the one thing that we live by as teachers to help children? And, and one thing we hear all the time, please share. Um, so we are these social beings. However, with COVID, how does that work? What does that look like? Um, what I do know is if we force children to, to be unsocial, um, and if we keep our interactions and relationships at a distance from, from children, then their ability to learn healthy relationships will be affected and they may even learn to mistrust us. So we want to build on those strong relationships. So the most important point that we must keep in mind is that through reciprocal, this back and forth, give and take um, communication and interactions that we have with children, and responsive interactions that we have with, with others, children are building an internal model and laying the foundation of how they will establish relationships with others for the rest of their lives. That's how important relationships and social emotional development are for children. So we can't leave them behind. All learning and development takes place within healthy relationships. Um, and also healthy, uh, healthy social and emotional development. So this learning cannot wait. There has to be long, or there will be long-term consequences if we do. These interaction strategies that we're going to be covering here for the next few minutes are the essence of relationship building in the high scope curriculum. We know children come from all different types of environments and cultures with or without COVID. We've been doing this for a long time. So now even in the midst of COVID, these strategies allow us to build trust with children and strengthen our relationships with them so that we can model social emotional development. So we need to be aware of when children are in need for social emotional development. We need to be able to assure them that things are going to be okay by acknowledging their feelings and offering that comfort and contact that they need. So when we see a child in distress, we need to be there for this child. We, need, we don't want, always want, um, we don't want children to, who are feeling in distress um, to just be sitting there. We can't just leave children crying. We have to be able to support them. We have to acknowledge those feelings and provide that comfort and affection. And again, just keep in mind that many of these, these pictures have been taken before COVID. So teachers don't have their masks on, but what we want to keep in mind is that teachers would be wearing their masks um, during COVID. So here you can see this teacher, she doesn't have her mask on, but again, this was taken prior to COVID. 
but as of now in COVID, we would be wearing our, our masks. So even comforting children um, during COVID when um, with our masks on are important and vital to those children. Because again, they're building trust with us. And if they can't trust that we're gonna take care of their needs, then they're not going to build trust with us. So even after all, you know, we, we've comforted them, we've offered them, um, we've calmed their feelings down, we've reassured them. Um, again, um, when everything's feeling well and, and we've touched them, we've, we've wiped their tears, we've wiped their noses, we need to wash our hands. Um, so we need to make sure that we're following those, those safety procedures. Other ways to offer comfort and contact is to ask children what they need. Oh, you're looking really sad. You know, how can I help you? Um, what, you're feeling really sad that mom had to leave today. What can we do to help you feel better? So always keep in contact and touch with them. Um, in the morning, we greet children, you know, um, and a lot of times, most of the time when I, when I was teaching, they got a hug, you know, so how do we do that now that we have COVID? It's okay to give hugs um, as children need them, but if you want to set a morning ritual, ask them how they want to be greeted. Maybe it is that you, you do air hugs or air high fives, whatever, or an elbow or, or whatever they want to do in terms of, of greeting them and showing them that you're present here with them and that you, that you are interested in, and want to know and, and, and love them. We want to look for children's strengths, even when they are not abiding by those social distancing rules. You know, sometimes the children are gonna forget. Again, we're, they're social beings. We're social beings, again. I always forget. I forget to put my mask on, or I forget not to touch somebody, or I forget, you know, that, that it's not okay to, 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 to be closer than six feet. So even we forget. So we're gonna constantly need to remind children. So having concrete ideas by social stories and talking with them throughout the day about these things, but don't make it feel as though they've done something wrong because they haven't. Um, um, they haven't done anything wrong. Um, and again, we want them to build those relationships with us and, and not distrust us. We can't become so rigid that our behave, with our behaviors with children that again, that they build that mistrust. We want them to really want to come to school. Um, and we don't want children walking away saying, mom, I don't wanna go to school tomorrow because I can't play with my friends. Um, you know, so those are true feelings that they're going to learn if we, if we continue to um, not allow them to be these social, social beings and, and work together with children. Um, get children's perspectives about COVID and, and how this will affect them in the classroom. Um, as situations come up, we can put things in place, but there's always going to be things that are going to occur. Use those opportunities as problem solving situations um, and, and social stories and talking with children about what might happen and coming up with ideas that, that you can do. This will be a learning process for everyone. And when we involve children in decision-making within reason, um, then we can better meet their needs. So another strategy is to form authentic relationships with children. Um, we need to be present, sharing ourselves with children, enjoying our time with them. I know it's gonna be stressful. From day to day, we're gonna be stressed because we have to take temperatures. And what if we hear if somebody comes down with COVID? How, how, do, we, how do we help um, prevent that stress from um, getting into our classrooms. And so we have to practice ways that are going to calm our bodies down and calm our minds so that, that we can provide a safe environment for children as well as ourselves. Um, take interest in what they're doing and, and what they're learning. Take pleasure even in the small moments when you see a bug crawling up in a child's arm. Take time to, to, to talk about that and, and get children's perspective of that. Remember that learning can take place outdoors as well. Um, so take as much advantage, especially those of us in the more winter areas. Um, we have to take advantage of the time that we have outside um, so that children can be learning. Take small group time outside, take large group time outside. Um, that's going to help be able to build those interactions that we have with children um, in safe ways. But when we can't provide that, then we can always um, work other ways to, to develop that. So we want to have those authentic conversations as well with children. Modeling give and take communication skills so children can develop strong language and communication skills themselves. 
when we ask thought-provoking questions to get them to think about what they're doing and the ideas they have, then their learning goes further and their language and vocabulary increases. Even in the midst of COVID, I may, lie, I may not lie next to a child and read a book or talk with them about it, um, but if I did, I would have a mask on and, and I would make sure that I'm conversing with them as a partner and talking with them about what they're learning. Children still need to know the closeness of adults, especially those who come from families who don't get this at home because you are their only resource in, in ways of, of building those relationships with them. The major question that has to be asked um, is what do I do about children sharing and interacting with one another during work time or choice time? Like I mentioned earlier, children are social beings and so are we. Because learning about healthy social skills are so vital um, to children at this age, we have to allow this to happen within reason. If children do not want to play with each other, then great. There's times where we can provide those social distancing. Um, we still want them to be able to, to see what each other are doing and build in, in, and learn from each other. So even though these children are, are, are working across um, the room from each other, they can still see each other working and get ideas and talk with each other uh, about that. Um, however, when children do want to play with each other, or maybe it's not right, um, or maybe they're not sitting right next to each other, but maybe it is that they're sitting across the table from each other. Um, or maybe when they do want to play with each other in, in, a, in, in a way that they're um, role playing, um, then maybe we, we ask them to put masks on. Maybe it is that, that um, we ourselves who are wearing masks as adults and teachers, and when we join their play, um, we want them to wear masks too, because they're gonna be a little bit closer to them. And it's okay to ask them to wear a mask um, during role play in that house area or that, that block area so that, that they're practicing those safe um, things in the classroom. Um, so we as teachers also want to join children at their level you know, parallel play with them and, and take on roles with them. Um, but, but when we do share materials, we, we might need to go wash our hands um, and, and make sure that we're following those, those procedures. Again, when we engage in interactions with children, we're gonna be wearing those masks, but we still want to use the same strategies for participating in their play. Again, the easiest way to engage in children's play is using those materials ourselves. So making sure that we have a set of materials ourselves. And when we're done with this, put it in the toy, or put it in the box that, that needs to be disinfected so that those uh, materials are gonna be cleaned and safe for the next use. Um, and then keeping, we wanna make sure that we keep within those same role, the role playing that, that they assign us to um, and match that complexity with their play. So the last strategy and important um, to children's self-regulation is developing those social problem skills. Children will have conflicts even with COVID. We know that, that it doesn't matter um, whether sickness is happening or whether it's just an ordinary day, conflicts are gonna happen. Um, so when we treat this learning as any other learning skill, instead of punishment, then children will learn skills that allow them to resolve conflicts with others instead of resulting in violence which will carry, which these skills will carry on into adulthood. So by participating with children um, in these six steps to conflict resolution um, and, and acknowledging those emotions, um, and then we can validate those feelings and, and it be, they'll be able to learn healthy social behaviors um, to resolve their conflicts and they'll become confident problem solvers themselves. So we briefly taken a look at adult child interaction strategies that will allow us to continue to build healthy, strong relationships with children with some modifications in our interactions. But one thing that we need to keep in mind is that whatever our programs have set in place, you know, we're giving you recommendations, but we can't tell you that this is what should be done. You have to follow what your program tells you to do. Um, so can we, Advocate for best practice, absolutely. So talking with your supervisors, talking with your directors and, and, and talking about what's best practice um, and, and still allowing those interactions to happen, that would be best to do. Um, so 
but we want you to be empowered as decision makers yourselves. We want you to think about your children. What is best for them? What do you see happening for them? How are you meeting their needs? So you're taking cues from them. So we can give you all these great ideas, but ultimately you need to decide on yourself what is going to be best for your children and what's happening in your classroom. Look to your curriculum for ideas. Look to your curriculum for ways of working with children and interacting with them. Try it out. If it works, great. Um, if it doesn't, go back to the drawing board. Work with your co-teachers and brainstorm with your co-teachers about how things are going and get ideas from from other teachers about what's happening in their programs because that's all gonna help you be a better teacher um, and help with children in the classroom. Um, ask children for their ideas. You know, they have great ideas and it's great to share your feelings and your anxieties with them. I'm worried about how you guys are interacting right now. Um, you know, it, you're really close to each other without masks. Um, so I'm wondering if maybe we might need to get masks on right now if you're going to continue. So it's okay to talk things through with them, but be careful that we're not setting a stage of fright for children. We want children to be safe in our environment so that they can, can explore and build relationships with others and with ourselves. Refer to NACI. They have wonderful resources. Continue to check the HiScope website out. We have um, lots of ways of supporting um, and continue to help you. So I'm going to hand things over to Holly, who's going to focus more on establishing relationships with children and families virtually. Great. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, I really, really appreciate the mix of pictures of our normal as we used to know it in early, as early childhood educators with what's our now normal in light of this pandemic. You're so right. Thank you so much for just reminding us that COVID cannot win. Um, the results of that could be just detrimental to child growth and development. Our social presence, our emotional body language, all of that is so important right now. And we really need to pay attention to that as educators. We simply cannot use COVID-19 as an excuse to not provide children what we know, what years of research has told us, um, but we know that children need to grow and develop. High quality adult child interactions must occur even if it's from a slightly further distance or from behind masks. Similarly, our go-to family engagement strategies may also need to be adjusted. However, it also remains as important as ever. For many of us, we are in a completely virtual environment. So it begs the question, how do we establish relationships through screens? First thing, as always, we need to ensure that we are making connections with our families. For many of them, this might be their child's first foray into school. To build lifelong learners and true partnerships with families, we have to make those strong personal connections right from the get-go. That doesn't change this year. This means that our initial conversations with families might have to be one-on-one, -on -one. maybe even for those first several weeks, we're going to meet individually or in very small groups. Maybe we just start with smaller pods of children and families in our classroom. So two or three families that maybe share a common link. So perhaps their neighbors or friends, cousins, or it might even be families that we choose to place together because they have specific concerns or they have a lifestyle that might be similar to somebody else. So those families that maybe have two working parents or those families that have multiple children of various ages that are all at home right now. Perhaps it's people that have been affected by COVID in similar ways. So our essential workers or those who have affected family members or people perhaps who are recently unemployed. So really starting to think about how we build those relationships um, and build relationships among smaller groups of people before we invite more and more children and families into the fold. Active engagement will also be key, but we really need to make sure that we are individualizing our communication with our families. We need families to understand that we are putting their health and their well being at the top of our list of things that's important during this pandemic as well. We want them to know that they have us in their corner. Virtual learning is hard. Parents have enormous stressors on them right now. Even those families who have access to learning, whose lives have not been upended by COVID, 
whose children maybe can easily adapt to screen learning um, and who are adept at balancing schoolwork and other family responsibilities. Um, those families also may still struggle from time to time with all of the expectations that are being placed on them. So we need to be there to support them when everything becomes overwhelming. Um, and the way that we're gonna do that is by breaking it down to meet them where they're at on their, their own individual levels. We need to support and scaffold their learning just as we would do the same for a child who's in our classrooms. Weekly check-ins just to see how families are coping might become regular parts of our schedule. We want to reassure parents with encouraging phrases. So we might say things like, yeah, I understand that this is probably really difficult. What can I do to help? Or sometimes even just a simple, thank you so much for taking time to chat with me today. I really appreciate your investment in your child's schooling. Statements like that can really go a long way. When we think about individualizing communication, we need to consider what that looks like for each family. Where are our families and what level of support do they need right now, right in this moment? Are they ready to jump right in with lesson plans and child development support strategies? Or perhaps they need just more assurance, reassurances at this moment. Do they have a daily schedule? And if they do have a daily schedule, is that schedule actually working for them? And if not, perhaps we can support them in changing that or adjusting that. Do they have access to food? Do they have access to health care? Do they have a way to keep paying their bills? The ways in which we approach all of these conversations is definitely going to be very different. We also want to make sure that we're thinking about frequency. So how many times a week perhaps will you be in contact? Will it be daily? Will it always be live? Or might it include some different types of communication, perhaps email or mailing of pamphlets or other resources, phone calls, pre-recorded videos, all of those are different ways that we can communicate and we can think about how we're designing that all together. We also wanna think about how long we're going to allot for each of these conversations. If the child is involved, we definitely wanna make sure that we are aware of the American Academy of Pediatrics and we're keeping those in mind as we're designing these interactions. So perhaps we're just going to have 10 or 15 minute small group time that involves some children, but then we're going to stay on to chat with parents for an additional five minutes to share some additional extension activities. We also want to think about where these conversations might take place. Do they all need to be virtual? Or might we be able to practice some social distancing, perhaps at the family's home, on their front yard or their backyard, or maybe it's at your center or school's playground. We may be able to set up some sort of a drive-through where parents can come drive through and pick up some supplies and materials and drop off different supplies and materials that they had at home and we can have some exchanges that way. Um, the location or the mode of communication might need to change throughout the week or throughout your month based on the type of activity that we are providing. We may also wanna work with families to determine their needs. So whether you put out a formal survey or you gather information just based on our informal conversations that we're having with families, we want to determine what the family considers to be their hopes and dreams, right? What are they hoping to get out of this virtual arrangement? We can set those goals together with the family. We can design our lessons and our engagement strategies around those goals. We wanna figure out the supports that family members think that they might need, and then design some solutions together to whatever their barriers of participation are. Finally, to truly support families, we really wanna make sure that we are building in consistency and routines. So a calendar or some sort of a consistent schedule will definitely need to be designed. Families are going to need to know when to expect our visits, our phone calls, when they need to log in for a specific meeting, and they should have been given enough notice in order to properly prepare everything that they want to prepare on their end. So, they, so that they have everything that they need ready to go. Our family engagement interaction strategies actually are gonna remain the same. So just like Shannon mentioned earlier, with our adult child interaction strategies, the same is true with our family engagement interaction strategies. These have not changed due to COVID. We still need to be very authentic. We need to let our families into our lives too. 
we need to let them know that we also are not in love with this idea of virtual learning. That we have concerns that their children might not be receiving the same social interaction benefits as they would of being in an actual physical classroom. We want to talk with them about how we understand that they're trying to juggle a lot. We're also living it, right? This is happening to us as well. So flexibility and understanding is going to be key this year. We may also just bluntly state that we understand the emotional toll that homeschooling is taking on families. And also let's use the term homeschooling lightly because what we're doing is actually not truly homeschooling. Parents who choose that route do so with care. They have the ability to access community resources. And in many cases, they also join other homeschooling families for regular social interactions. That isn't happening right now. We are still very much in crisis or pandemic schooling, whatever you want to call it, COVID schooling, and it's hard. And we need to let parents know that we understand that. We want them to know that we care, that we're thankful that they're letting us into their homes as opposed to judging what it is that we might be seeing behind that video camera, right? That we're thankful for these interactions, that our ability to build true partnerships is more important than ever and although those reciprocal relationships might be through different modes of communication than what we are used to, they still very much need to be present in all of our programs. That said, there definitely are some activities that we can integrate to help build some of these relationships. Some of those are included here. So in school, we may have created books about All About Me, perhaps, um, and at home, Maybe it becomes a, sto a storyboard or a newsletter that parents are contributing to, and then we as educators are compiling and sharing out with everyone. Children and families can share videos or photographs of themselves engaged in their favorite activities, eating their favorite foods, or maybe they're just even going to walk us around their home. Maybe instead of those interesting facts, right, we're going to collect some boring pandemic facts. I know our own family has definitely started some family movie nights and spaghetti and meatballs has been one of, become one of our new favorite foods because we're cooking at home so much more right now. So whatever it might be, you wanna make sure that you are facilitating the building of relationships between families. We're gonna watch a video right now of Jenny, who is our preschool teacher here at High Scope, um, and she's walking children around her backyard. There is a part in this video where Jenny turns her head away from her microphone. So your volume might get a little quieter. So just something to be aware of, you might need to turn up your volume. But as we've discussed, relationships start when we let families in, when we're authentic and when we're real. We don't live lavish lives either, we're educators. Um, so as you're watching, I really want you to notice how Jenny is interacting with her children and her families. Even though this is a pre-recorded video, she's, she's definitely interacting with them and then she's giving them something to do as a follow-up activity. So we're gonna go ahead and watch that now. Hi boys and girls, Jenny here. I thought today we might spend some time outside because it's so nice and sunny and maybe look for some interesting things that we can find outdoors. So what kind of things do you think we'll find outdoors today? Could be things that are alive, could be things that are not alive, could be plants, animals, could be rocks, I don't know. Let's see. So I remember boys and girls when we were back in school together on the playground, a lot of us like to look for and pick up interesting rocks we would find. And collecting rocks is one of my hobbies. So these are some of the special ones that I found on the beaches. And I like this one a lot because I think it looks like a smiley face. And I like this one because it reminds me of a paw print. So boys and girls, here's another thing I found. Here's this little plant and it has bright blue flowers and green leaves. And I think it's called a forget me not, but I think it's interesting because I didn't plant it here. So I don't know where it came from. Sometimes when we're outside, we might hear interesting sounds too. Do you hear that sound? What do you think could be making that sound? It sounds like some kind of machine or tool. So I looked up in the tree too, and I saw this bird's nest. 
I wonder what kind of bird is living in it. So I found some interesting kinds of plants too. You see that yellow flower in the middle, that's called a dandelion. I like to let dandelions grow in my yard because they're so helpful to bees. These little purple flowers are called clover. These also grow in my yard. These are nice for bees. And remember all the helicopter seeds that we saw on the playground from our big tree? I found some in my yard too. I don't know if you guys can see, but I just saw a bird fly into that nest. I can see just its head poking up. I think it might be a robin. Something else I like to look at is the clouds too. Sometimes you can see interesting shapes in the clouds. So I remember a question that some of you boys and girls would ask me was about what kind of car do I drive and what did it look like? Well, there it is. It's a gray escape. <laughs> so I decided to see what was underneath these rocks. Let's see what's underneath these. Ooh, looks like we found some worms. Looking around the worms, there's all kinds of little holes in the ground too. I wonder if the worms made those. Let's see what's underneath this rock. Hmm, more holes, but I don't see any worms. Well, boys and girls, thank you for exploring my yard with me. I hope you liked seeing some of the things around my backyard. I wonder what you'll find around your home outside. Take a picture, let us know. Till next time, bye. All right. Yeah, I love that video. Um, it just, she's, Jenny is just so authentic in it. Um, we've got dandelions in our backyard too, right? And that's okay. She's presenting herself in very non-judgmental ways and making these relationships and these connections very simply. So start easy. When you're just starting to build relationships, start easy, just like Jenny did in this video. It doesn't even have to be that long. And then over time, what we're gonna do is we're slowly going to build up to some of that content. We're gonna start to make our shift into a coaching role. So during COVID and virtual learning, our job is really going to be to support and coach parents in supporting and teaching their children. True family engagement is considering ways that our support of families helps families then engage with their children when we're not there. And this year, we're not there. COVID has made sure of that for some of us. So when our families are ready, we can really start to begin to share some of these other resources. Video tutorials to help families build their own daily schedules. Maybe we're gonna give them some visuals that they can post in their own homes, or we can share resources about child development. We really wanna make sure that we are helping our families understand developmentally appropriate expectations. Your child might not make it through an entire book in one sitting, or they might need to stand instead of sit in order to complete some specific tasks. Sensory breaks might be something that's important and you're gonna make sure that you need to build in. All of this information we can share with families, again, on that individualized level, when you determine that families are ready to digest it. And when it comes to digestion, we wanna make sure that we are providing bite-sized chunks of information so as not to overwhelm our families. We wanna remember that our goal is relationship building and a partnership. When we're creating lesson plans, whether that's a small group or a large group or even a read aloud, we wanna make sure that we're providing the information in a way that's built for success. So think carefully about the materials. Are the materials that are in every child's home is there a material that you're providing perhaps? Or have you given enough options for materials that parents can successfully implement without feeling the pressure to complete the activity in the exact same way as you? We also wanna differentiate for different levels. So we're gonna talk about child development and what children might do during an activity. And then we're gonna follow that up with ways that family members can support and scaffold their own children's learning. We're gonna offer a mixture of live virtual activities, perhaps those where we're modeling for family members, some of those strategies in the moment by responding to their child and engaging directly with them. 
And then we may also have some pre-recorded videos that include strategies right within the recording. We're actually gonna watch another video right now. This one is also of Jenny, but here she's really building science content. So I want you to watch how she models experimenting, predicting, and drawing conclusions. Not just the child, but then also how she flips it and coaches the parent. Hello families, welcome to today's activity, Racing at the Preschool Raceway. For this activity, you'll need the small toy car that was included in your materials activity kit for the week, and also something to make a ramp to roll your car down and something to prop that ramp up. I'm using a long piece of cardboard and a shoe box. You could also use things like uh, plastic tote lids, cookie sheets, large books, um, paper tubes, clipboards, anything that's large enough to roll a car down. So in this activity, we're going to be scientists by making predictions and experimenting to test our ideas out. Every experiment starts with a question. And our question is today, what do you, th what do you predict will happen when we put this car at the top of the ramp? And remember, prediction is when you say something that you think will happen. Let's make our predictions. I predict that when I put my car at the top of the ramp, it's gonna roll down. Maybe fast, I don't know. Let's test out that idea by experimenting. All right, are you ready for the first experiment? Let's see what happens. Whoa, what happened? It rolled down the ramp, it did. It didn't go really fast though. It kind of went medium speed, not fast, but not slow. Hmm, what do you think made it go that speed? It looks like part of my prediction was correct. I predicted that if I put it on the top of the ramp, that it would roll down, but I thought it was gonna go fast, but it kind of just went medium. Hmm, that leads us to our next question. How do you think we can make it go even faster? I remember a while back seeing balls rolling down the slide at the playground. And when we put the balls towards the bottom of the slide where it wasn't very high, the balls didn't roll fast. But I remember when we put the balls up high at the top of the slide, they rolled really fast. Just now, my ramp isn't that high, so it didn't go very fast. I'm predicting that maybe if we move this end of the ramp up higher and taller, like the tall side, I'm predicting that it might make my car go faster. Let's experiment and test it out. All right, guys, so I raised up the incline of our ramp, so now it's more steep, like the slide. So let's test it out. Remember, we predicted that it would go faster. Let's see what happens. Are you ready? Whoa, did you see that? Oh my goodness. It did go faster, our prediction was correct. The taller the ramp and the higher the slope, the faster it went. So now I wonder what your next predictions will be and what different kinds of ramps you might build. Show us and tell us about your raceways. What kinds of, what kinds of predictions did you make? And what happened when you experimented? Was it what you expected? or did something different happen? And why do you think it happened that way? So while you're racing cars at home with your preschooler, you can comment on how they're using the materials, how they're making the ramps and what they're doing with them. You can ask them to describe what's happening and also to explain their thinking by asking them questions like, why do you think that happened that way? When you try out this activity with your preschooler, you can extend it by trying out different kinds of materials of different lengths and sizes to use as a ramp. You can experiment with different heights to use as inclines for the ramp. Also try starting your race out in different spots on the ramp from the top to the bottom and see how it happens differently. If you have extra things to roll down the ramp like balls, extra cars, toilet paper tubes, maybe roll them side by side and have a race. You can also use measuring tapes and rulers to mark and measure distance. You could also use a stopwatch or the timer on your cell phone to measure the length of time that the material rolls. 
To send us your results, you can send us notes, pictures, and videos via email, and also send us your results through the Core Advantage Family Portal. We can't wait to hear from you. Until next time, bye. Great. So I apologize for the lag. I noticed that there was a little bit of lag on my end. So if that happened on your end as well, this video will be posted on our YouTube site. So you can get it and see the actual video without that lag time there. But again, just another authentic example of how teachers can help parents really understand some of our academic content and the benefits of active learning. She made learning in that preschool raceway activity both engaging for the child but then she also made that learning visible for the parents. So something that's going to be really key in this virtual learning format. So just to wrap up, I just wanna remind you of a few ongoing, strat or ongoing engagement strategies. Some of these we've already mentioned, but I just wanna draw your attention back to them. So first, our expectations of our family members must be clear, but also flexible. We might need to shift our expectations of families to meet their needs. Make sure families know of whatever our expectations are of them in advance. So it might be something like when it's small group time, I'd love for you to be at the table next to your child. And for some parents, that might be it. Presence today is a win, right? For others, it might be that we want them to have their own materials and imitate what children are doing. And still others might be ready to extend their children's learning with some open-ended questions and really prompting child language and thought. Um, we may also need to back it even way up further than that, just to say, do you think you could help your child just log into our meeting today? So give yourself and our families that room for adjustment. Mental flexibility using our own executive functioning skills is going to be really useful for us over these next few months. We also wanna help families build connections with one another. And we talked about a couple of different ways to do this. So starting small, one-on-one, -on -one, and then building up. We could also host um, some parent-only support groups or learning opportunities. Um, maybe it's just going to be a time where we can kind of vent about things that are happening and then do some problem solving together as a group. Weekly check-ins, again, where we're focused on the health and the well-being of the family first, are going to become especially important when somebody isn't present in one of your meetings. I noticed you didn't log in to the meeting earlier today or earlier this week. Is everything okay? A little caring on our part is going to go a long way with our family members. And then of course, if it's a mode of communication that doesn't seem to be working, the family always is keeping their video camera off or they're no longer joining meetings or maybe they're just not answering any of your phone calls, switching your mode of communication might be helpful. Um, we could even have other parents perhaps reach out and check in if they just aren't interested in interacting with us. Uh, we could ask for things like read receipts, right? Um, so if we're using email, or we can use those family engagement reports on Core Advantage to look and see how many times they are opening the things that we are sending home. Sometimes our families are interacting, even if it's in different ways than what we had originally thought or intended. Finally, and above all else, we want to remember when we are teaching virtually that we are visitors in our families' homes. It's almost as if we are on a home visit once a week or once a day, or sometimes in some of your cases, even multiple times a day. And that in and of itself can be really stressful for our family members. So we truly need to build these relationships and become partners with them. All right, we are now going to switch over to our live question and answer part of the presentation. We do have over 4,000 people that have registered for this webinar, so we're tr we will try to get to as many different questions as possible, but we cannot promise that we'll have time to answer them all. If you have not already, please make sure that you type your questions into that Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Shannon, have you looked and seen any questions in there? Yes, um, there's uh, one that's asked by Tara Fosdick, um, and again, this has to do with meal times. Um, she's asking, when we sit down to eat and have to take off, and have to take off our mask to eat, doesn't that negate the point of the mask? So she's been talking to other teachers um, about it, and um, 
uh, it doesn't negate um, the the point of a mask. It's just that we can't eat with masks on. I mean, we have to take masks off, even if, even even us as adults. However, if we're spacing our children out a little bit, then that keeps the air that's being spoken from going into other children's faces and teachers' faces. So that's why they're asking us to space children out a little bit more. Um, so that you definitely need to make sure that there is space. And if you don't have enough room at the table, maybe it is that you move them to other areas um, so that children are spaced out a little bit better. Great. Thanks, Shannon. I also see another question in here um, that maybe you can answer. So um, what about infants and toddlers? So sometimes um, as adults are wearing masks, infants and toddlers specifically might try to remove those masks. Um, so what are some strategies that you have? So we're not just always telling them to stop. Um, what are some strategies that you might have around that one? Yeah, when it comes to infants and toddlers, um, you know, again, we are going to be having a couple webinars later um, in October. Uh, October 6th will be the first one, um, and we'll be talking a lot about this. Um, but anything on your body, especially for infants, is fair game. So we know even infants go for glasses, they go for necklaces, they go for hair. You know, it's just really exploring who you are as, as an, a teacher and as a, a person in their life. So the masks are going to be another thing for them to, to um, explore. And it's just something that we're going to have to have, get used to, um, that they're just going to do it. Great. Um, I see another question in here about um, how are children going to be able to perhaps build some social skills with teacher's assistants if they're not able to see and interact with those teacher's assistants? Um, Shannon, do you have any kind of thoughts related to that one? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm I'm a little confused. I'm assuming that the teacher assistants are not going to be in the classrooms. Um, maybe it's more of a virtual question, um, Holly. Maybe maybe it is that only the teacher is being seen on virtually versus um, the assistants who are going to be working with them. So maybe you can kind of chime in as well. <laughs> Got it. Oh yeah. Okay. So I, I think I was thinking that maybe we're slow, we're making smaller classroom sizes. I think either way, right? If we, whether we're virtual or whether we um, are live and in the classroom, we want children to be able to build relationships with those teachers that they have the most direct interactions with. So whether um, you're in a classroom, if the teacher assistant simply isn't in the classroom, right, then, then we are not building relationships, especially with, with that person. Um, however, I do also think it's going to be really important for our um, teachers to really work together as a team and for both teachers, all teachers in the classroom um, to really be thinking about where are children developmentally right now and be able to bounce planning ideas off of one another um, so, so again, kind of thinking back, and Shannon, you mentioned this earlier, we need to take guidance from what our program is making decisions around. Um, but if this is a question about virtual learning, right, absolutely having our assistant teachers engage and interact and facilitate small groups or large groups just like they would in the classroom is going to be key. Um, if we're talking about a live environment, then um, perhaps we just won't have those interactions. Yeah, so there's uh, another question that came up about um, washing hands um, and hand sanitizers. Um, so we know in the past, um, uh, licensing would not allow you to use hand sanitizers, and now all of a sudden we are allowed to use them. Um, I'm not sure, this is a really good question, um, and maybe this is a question for the hand sanitizer people who are making them. Um, I have noticed that the alcohol is different, um, so maybe that might be a difference. Um, but we, want, we all want to make sure that children are safe. And if we can't access water right away, then this is an easy way to be able to help um, with that healthy hygiene in the classroom. Great. Um, there's a couple questions in here as well. Just general advice for um, working through interactions when children are upset. So it might be at drop off time, right? And drop off times aren't necessarily happening in our classrooms anymore. They're happening at doors um, or at the front of the school in some cases. Um, so any advice, Shannon, that you might have for um, engaging with children who perhaps are just working through some hard, tough, upset feelings? I think the biggest thing that, are, that is our best friend is acknowledging children's feelings, is, is really getting down and really 
um, um, seeing them face to face, communicating and building those those relationships. Because um, again, that body language is is huge in in trying to communicate with children. You know, ask acknowledging you're really upset. Tell me a little bit more about how you're feeling. You know, what can we do? You're uh, you know, because sometimes we might not know why they're upset. Um, so by asking them to to share um, their feelings and and really acknowledge those feelings is going to be helpful to really get down to the heart of those issues. Um, and, and then being able to, um, you know, develop some strategies, you know, whether it's uh, let's, let's have mom bring in a special thing from home that, that, that will remind you of her or a picture of her. Um, maybe it is you're doing a social story about drop off time or really makes it's what's hard for, for parents right now is that they can't come into the classroom. So those normal rituals that we would, that we would do with parents um, to allow for that separation anxiety, um, we can't do those now. Um, so there has to be something else put in place. Um, so maybe it's a little story that parents put together for their child mm -hmm. to take in with them. And then that's what they use in the morning um, to help them um, on their way. Or maybe when they're laying down and they're sad that they have to lay down, you know, so here's, here's a book that will help remind me of my mom and my parents. Great. Um, and then I see a couple questions about virtual learning. So um, what if children perhaps don't have a backyard? What are some other ways that they might be able to get some of that kind of physical development or those sensory needs met? Um, and so in this case, I think it really will take a lot of, of having conversations with your family. You know your families in those neighborhoods best. If neighborhoods are safe to go out into, um, perhaps it means that we're doing things out on the, out on the sidewalk. So um, maybe we're building um, hopscotch or, um, you know, we're just taking a walk around the block. Um, if, if that's not safe, but the family has access to a vehicle of some sort, perhaps it's going to visit a park or some other place um, where they can get some of that um, physical engagement, right, and physical development um, and meeting those sensory needs. So thinking through just what, what community resources do you have available will be important. We know that there are many other questions that were asked, um, but we know we're running out of time. In fact, we are over our time. Um, and again, just as a reminder, um, we are going to be talking more about the infants and toddlers. So keep in contact with us um, about that. Um, just know that coming in October, we're gonna look at supporting infant toddler teachers in the classroom through this pandemic, as well as looking at supporting families with infants and toddlers from a distance. Again, we know that is not going to be the same that we're doing with preschoolers. Infants and toddlers are a whole different ball game. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are um, helping parents meet needs of infants and toddlers, but we are not going to be doing virtual um, uh, learning with, with infants and toddlers. So keep that in mind. Great. Um, just a few more reminders as we close out our discussion today. A certificate of attendance will be emailed to you 24 hours after the close of this event. Um, and then additionally, we will have a recording of this event posted on our website. So you can find that at highscope.org backslash webinar and also on our YouTube channel. And then finally, we just have a few additional free resources that we hope you find helpful as you navigate your way through this unprecedented school year. Thanks again for joining us and best of luck to all of you as you begin this year.